Welcome to the uh, next talk in the series of CVS seminar for uh, Spring 2017. So today we have our own Scott Carr. Uh, Scott recently defended his uh, PhD successfully in Computer Science Department, uh, he, he where he worked with Professor Matthias Pyre. Uh, and then I guess he is going to join NGC soon. Uh, after finishing his PhD over here. Uh, Scott works on uh, typical, let's say, program analysis, data, uh, dynamic analysis, static analysis in that field. And today he is going to share one, uh, some of his recent work uh, that he is going to present next week at Asia CCS. And today he is going to talk more about uh, what he is going to talk over there, but obviously a bit more detail. So Scott, you. Right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so as Professor, Professor Zakate mentioned, I'm Scott Carr. I'm a uh, PhD student here at Purdue, and I recently defended. Uh, he mentioned that I work with Matthias Payer. Our group's called the Hex Hive Group, so if you want to Google that to find out any more information about the group, uh, you should be able to find that online. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting this paper. is uh, This talk is on the main research paper for uh, my thesis uh, that I've been working on for uh, three years now. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about the problem that I want to solve in my research and what motivates the problem, uh, why is it important? And then I'll give you the introduction to the, my talk and background that will make the rest of the talk uh, more understandable if we have this background information already covered. Uh, then I'll talk about the design and implementation of uh, data confidentiality and integrity, uh, which is the name of the project. And then I'll uh, give some highlights of the evaluation. There's a lot more in the paper. Basically, for each of these bullet points, there's more in the paper if you, that you can look into if you're uh, interested. And then uh, I'll wrap it up in the conclusion. So first, our motivation. So uh, we're interested, I'm interested in, uh, we call it language-based security, which is uh, using, uh, looking at why the C and C++ programming languages are insecure and why do they lead to uh, security problems. And in particular, I'm just gonna call out one recently found vulnerability. If, if you follow the security blogs, right? You see that new vulnerabilities are being found all the time, but we'll just talk about this one uh, a little bit. So it's called Heartbleed, and the root cause is a, a missing bounds check, and it's in the library called OpenSSL, which is a crypto library uh, implemented in C. And it allowed a clever attacker to send a message to the server, and then it would the server would send back its private encryption key, which could allow the attacker to impersonate the server. And this affects um, any server that uses OpenSSL, which Apache, Nginx, uh, the commonly used uh, Linux uh, web servers all use OpenSSL. And it could affect potentially up to 66% of websites on the internet, according to some metrics. So it's a really big vulnerability that has a high impact um, in terms of how widely it could be uh, exploited in the wild. So. <clears throat> A lot of security researchers are interested in saying, why didn't we already detect Heartbleed? There's a lot of security work in static analysis and bug finding, these different approaches. Um, but currently, none of those uh, found Heartbleed. Uh, in particular, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about uh, CFI, which is control flow integrity. And it basically says that I determine what the control flow of this program should be statically, and then at runtime I see, did my program deviate from this static uh, control flow graph? But the Heartbleed bug does not change the control flow of the program. It just simply leaked uh, sensitive data. So that motivates our work, which is looking at attacks that leak sensitive data or corrupt data on, on a remote server, for example, similar to the Heartbleed bug and uh, the exploit I described. And so we need new tools to protect sensitive data, like encryption keys or password lists or authentication tokens. And that's what uh, Data Shield and data confidentiality and integrity is targeted at. So um, the key insight of my work or the key idea is that some data are more sensitive than others and they're worth paying overhead to protect because the, my mechanisms in language-based security usually work by inserting additional security checks into the program uh, to check for, uh, for example, missing bounds checks for, for array out of bounds. And each of these new additional checks costs overhead. So we're proposing that you want to protect key data with these additional checks. Examples of uh, approaches along these lines that, that identify a specific subset of data to protect our stack canaries, which are special values that are on the stack that indicate that if the stack canary value changes, that indicates the attacker overwrote the stack and tried to corrupt the return address. Or a similar 
Another approach is uh, DEP, which says that any code that's in memory uh, can o cannot be writable. It can only be executable. So attackers would target the code to overwrite the code in memory with their own code and hijack the program. And the final example I'll give you is CPI, which is a uh, basically a specialized CFI. It, CPI stands for Code Pointer Integrity. And it keeps a, its own protected copy of all the function pointers and virtual function pointers in the program uh, and stops the attacker from uh, tampering with them. So all these mechanisms identify a subset of sensitive data and protect it. And our key difference is that we're enabling the programmer to choose which uh, data is protected. So the policies I mentioned before all have the data that is going to be protected chosen by the designer of the mechanism, and the programmer can, cannot change it. And the reason that we do partial protection rather than protecting the entire uh, program, for example, bonds checking every single pointer in the program, is that bonds checking every pointer is very expensive. And at a very, very high level, the way our mechanism works, as I briefly mentioned, is that we take the program source code, we compile it with our compiler, and then the resulting binary has additional security checks that are missing from the original program. So uh, this is going to further frame uh, the problem and how our solutions to that problem are going to be based on these assumptions. So we assume that only low overhead is acceptable. So uh, when we say low overhead, ideally we're getting down to 5 or 10% because uh, so this paper theorizes that if it's down, the overhead is only between 5 and 10% the end user might not even perceive it. Um, we assume that we have the program source code because as I mentioned, we're a compiler-based mechanism. We recompile the program. Uh, and we assume that the original program contains bugs. So the original program should um, properly process expected input, but the attacker can potentially create malicious input that uh, causes the program to leak sensitive data or to corrupt sensitive data. So. The key uh, concept uh, that we're going to talk about is memory safety. So memory safety means that uh, whenever you read and write through a pointer in a C or a C++ program, uh, you read or write the object to which the pointer was most recently assigned. And I'm going to go into detail about the different ways that this can be violated uh, on the next few slides. Uh, and it, I'm going to note that confidentiality means memory safety for reading, and integrity means confidential or memory safety for writing. So one way that you can break memory safety is a spatial memory safety violation. So say we have the code snippet uh, over on that side of the slide and then a buffer in memory somewhere. So we loop over the initialized i to 0, and we loop over the, the elements of the buffer, setting them all to some value. And this is fine as long as the buffer of i is still within the bounds of the array. But when we go past the end of the array, we write whatever memory happens to be there. And this is an out-of-bounds write and a violation of spatial memory safety. So we would like to ideally prevent these out-of-bound writes from happening. Another way that you can violate memory safety is uh, temporally. So in this example, we allocate an array on the heap using malloc, write to one of its ele elements, and then free it, free the buffer. So now it's gone. But we can still use the pointer to write to the element, an element of buff uh, that is pointing to now deallocated memory. And now this, in this way, we're writing to an unintended uh, memory location that doesn't contain the most recently assigned object. So this is another way of violating memory safety. So as I briefly talked about in the beginning, why don't we insert checks before every pointer dereference to see if the uh, pointed to object is the most recently assigned object? And the reason is that's overhead, uh, uh, costly in terms of overhead. So state of the art. Uh, complete memory safety mechanisms uh, have about 100% overhead or more, depending on the program itself and how often it uh, uses pointers. And the over overhead is a function of how many of these new checks we insert into the program. So the way we're going to tackle this problem is we're going to define a new policy uh, that allows for protecting only a subset of sensitive data with lower overhead. And we're going to uh, give several ways of implementing this new policy. And finally, we'll uh, evaluate the security of our implementation by seeing if it can detect uh, publicly uh, found or publicly available exploits. So now I'll describe the design of uh, data confidentiality and integrity. Uh, the, the design is that sensitive pointers can uh, 
access only the intended sensitive objects. So we have memory safety for sensitive pointers. Non-sensitive pointers are uh, isolated from sensitive data, but they can point anywhere except sensitive data. And then explicit data flow between sensitive and non-sensitive variables is forbidden. So the compiler is going to apply this policy to the compiled program that it's given. <clears throat> and at a high level, the way this works is that we divide memory into two regions. One contains sensitive data and one contains non-sensitive data. And in the sensitive region, it contains all, all the sensitive data as well as uh, metadata about those objects, which is, allows us to insert our bounds checks and track the size of the objects. In the non-sensitive region, we simply have all the non-sensitive data separated from all the sensitive data. And the way the, the programmer identifies the sensitive data is by using annotations. And our annotations are type-based. So if you add an annotation as shown at the bottom, uh, this makes the entire object sensitive. So if you, if you annotate a struct, it makes all the struct and all its members uh, sensitive. Sure. So uh, you're making this perfect uh, segregation between sensitive and non-sensitive, but there can be a situation where indeed at least the sensitive part want to read something from the non-sensitive case. Yeah. So currently there's no uh, support for information, any information flow between sensitive and non-sensitive. So our assumption is that the code that's dealing with sensitive stuff is going to do its own thing, deal with its sensitive data, and the non-sensitive stuff will be totally separate. Uh, in future work, we plan to investigate ways of making this safe. So maybe you could have a sanitizer that allows you to, to write from sensitive stuff down to, to non-sensitive stuff. Um, but that would be something that we're going to investigate in the future. So uh, along those same lines, if you, if you annotate a struct, all of its members are, the, are now sensitive. So this uh, annotation is recursive. One of the key uh, metrics or the key benefits of our approach is that you don't have to make many annotations because we don't want the programmer to have to do a lot of work and change a lot of their code. So when you annotate a struct, all the members of the struct are sensitive. And then recursively, if the, if the struct itself contains pointers to other structs, those types become sensitive as well. Uh, and pointers uh, to a type and the type itself have the same sensitivity. The only case where we don't have this recursive rule is for primitives, so integers, chars, uh, floats, they're not uh, ever explicitly sensitive types. And now I'm going to talk about the implementation of our uh, mechanism, which is, as I mentioned, implemented at a compiler. We use the LLVM compiler infrastructure. Um, so the annotations look exactly like uh, this. So say we have a struct foo, and we put the annotation before some instance of foo. Now all foos in the program are going to be sensitive. So let's say we allocate a, a struct foo on the heap using malloc. The first thing we do is replace the normal malloc call with a call to our region-based allocator, which I showed the diagram before with the sensitive stuff on top. So the our allocator ensures that this allocation will be in the correct region. The second thing we do is that we want to be able to bounce check all these objects, right? So we have to record this first address of the object and the last address, and we put that in a metadata table, which I again talked at the beginning, it's above the uh, sensitive, non-sensitive region boundary in the memory overview diagram. So we, we, we record uh, the base address as the pointer returned by malloc, and the last address is the pointer times the size of the struct. Then uh, let's say now we dereference the pointer to foo. Now is the time that we want to do the bounce checking. So in this example, we have uh, pointer arrow x. Uh, before we can dereference the pointer to determine if it's safe, we look up the bounds of this, this pointer using the address of the pointer. And then we check that the pointer is between, of course, the first and last address of the object. Now for an, a non-sensitive object, so anything that hasn't been uh, of the annotated type, we again replace the malloc, but this time we put in the non-sensitive malloc, which ensures that the object will be allocated below the boundary. Um, and then when we dereference a pointer that's uh, non-sensitive, we, we have to ensure that it doesn't point up into the sensitive region. And one way of implementing that is using a mask, as shown here, where we clear the upper bits so the maximum value of the pointer is below the boundary uh, after it's been masked. And then we allow the pointer dereference to happen. So I mentioned that it's uh, implemented in a compiler. The compiler pass has two different parts. Um, 
it has a module analysis where it finds all the sensitive types, all the annotations that I mentioned before. And then I mentioned the other piece is the data flow piece. So the data, it does an interprocedural uh, context, context sensitive analysis to find all the uh, variables that have data flow with the variables of the annotated types and it makes them all sensitive. Uh, at runtime, there is a library for actually uh, creating, separating the sensitive and non-sensitive variables. It, it has different allocators for uh, the heap variables. It maps, uh, it separates the, the stack variables and creates a stack dedicated to this non-sensitive region. And then globals are mapped into their regions by a linker script that uh, will map the non-sensitive globals to the non-sensitive region uh, appropriately. And the same thing for the sensitive globals. So now I'll talk about uh, the evaluation of our uh, mechanism. So this is going to be the highlights of the uh, evaluation from the actual <laughs> paper. So if you're interested, there's a few more case studies in there that you can check out. So a key question that we want to answer is, um, does our idea of protecting a subset of the data, do we actually observe lower overhead when we have this condition? So uh, this graph shows two experiments uh, for two micro benchmarks that I wrote um, that were designed to allow me to control what percent is non-sensitive and what percent is sensitive. So the, the first one is insert, insertion sort. So it creates two arrays. One is a non-sensitive array and one is a sensitive array and it puts random data in them and sorts them using insertion sort. And I can, the input to the program is the size of the two arrays. How much sensitive data do I want? The number of elements in the, the non-sensitive array, the number of elements in the sensitive array. And going on the bottom axis from left to right, that's having a higher percentage of sensitive data. So as we would expect, or as our hypothesis was that as we increase the amount of sensitive data, we're putting in more and more checks or executing more and more checks and our overhead is increasing. So for point of comparison, uh, we have softbound and softbound CETS. Uh, those are two mechanisms that give uh, complete memory safety. So softbound is complete space. Okay, that's interesting. It is on. I don't understand this. One second. How are we? Oh, we have a ton of time left. Yes. We have still half, and we have 20 minutes, yeah, 25 okay, minutes. Okay, good. For some reason, you go ahead and continue. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so. Did he say something? Okay. So, uh, as we can see, I was, so I was describing softbound and softbound sets. They're total memory safety. So as we move, their, their overhead is totally independent of the amount of sensitive data because it treats everything the same. In, in fact, softbound and softbound sets don't even read the annotations. So they don't have any idea how much data is sensitive according to our annotations. So question? Sure. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you mean by, so it's an insertion sort, right? So, so let's say insertion, I'm sorting an array. Yeah, right. And half of the elements are insensitive and half are non-sensitive. But, but then how can we compare? Because the, there's a clear separation. So it's not always half. It's 10% are sensitive, 10% are non-sensitive, up to 90% yeah, are sensitive. Yeah, uh, but right? then how are you going to compare them? Because you're not going to take anything from the sensitive area and make it accessible. So let's say you want to compare one element in sensitive and right. Another in they're, yeah. Sorry. They're, they're totally separate. So it sorts the sensitive array and then it sorts the non-sensitive array. So it does. It sorts two totally separate arrays. It's basically like imagine you have a program that deals with sensitive data, does a bunch of stuff, does deals with non-sensitive data, does a bunch of stuff, and they're totally separate. But it's still sorting. The amount of elements that it's sorting is the same. It's just how much is sensitive and how much is non-sensitive. But they're two totally different arrays. They can't be. You can't have an array that mixes sensitivity. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, because I was just been trying to understand the experiment. Uh, because especially in your second example, maybe as I increase, let's say you have 10,000 elements, yeah. 
in your array, maybe the green line is catching up and making it almost equal to the blue line or something. So, like. so, so how yeah. big was your data sets here? Um, it's I, it's pretty big. I think it's hundreds of thousands or millions. Okay, so of it's dollars. already so, quite big. Yeah, so I need to run it for a long time in order to make, uh, you know, account for measurement noise and get uh, good results. Uh, in terms of being run long enough to measure the time accurately. So it's a really big array. Uh, it runs for like, I don't know, a minute or something. Uh, so uh, the other benchmark is find max, which is just a linear scan of the two arrays. Um, yeah, and as you pointed out, the, the overhead of um, softbound decreases in this, I, I attribute that to measurement noise or perhaps some optimization that uh, softbound implemented in their uh, compiler that's kicking in on this benchmark. I, I don't know the details of the implementation of softbound, so I, I can really only speak to what's what I've done. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Uh, how come the overhead is below zero? So it's there's a, there's a couple different sources of speed up in the program. One is that um, when we do the sensitive regions, we're changing the locality and cache effects. So we actually observed in doing our benchmarks that we would tend to speed up programs by do, using our partitioning and changing the way the allocator works. Um, for the other benchmarks, we actually uh, use the region-based allocator uh, when we evaluate the baseline. because we So we have a run that has no instrumentation, then we have a run with our instrumentation, and we compare them to figure out what our overhead is. We found that the regions were giving us a little bit of an unfair advantage because we were increasing locality and having a lot fewer page faults. So we ran everything in the next, uh, the remaining slides that I'll show you with the region-based allocator, which separated uh, the two regions. It's an interesting question, though. Uh, any other questions at this point? Uh, yeah, so I think I've talked about that a lot. Uh, so then the other question that we'd be interested in knowing is, let's say that our hypothesis that we have a really small amount of sensitive data holds and we're mostly working on non-sensitive non -sensitive data but we still have to stop the sensitive pointers from ever pointing into the sensitive region so we evaluated the spec benchmarks uh, in this configuration uh, the spec cpu 2006 benchmarks are pretty much the standard in my field for for benchmarking performance however they're not really security critical programs they're like uh, one is a chess simulator, one is a Go board game simulator, one is, uh, you know, a pathfinding algorithm. So there isn't necessarily sensitive data, but these are simply measuring used to figure out what the overhead is for a variety of programs. Uh, so there are th the, uh, along the bottom of this uh, axis are the individual benchmarks, and then the different colored bars are three different ways of enforcing the isolation of non-sensitive stuff from sensitive stuff. So in my example in the beginning, I showed we used a mask to clear the upper bits uh, so that the pointer can't point up into the sensitive region, but there's a, two other ways of enforcing that. Um, one of the, the first of the two is MPX, which is a hardware feature by Intel. Uh, it actually introduces four new bounds registers and explicit bounds check instructions uh, that you can use to, to do bounds checking. So the way we use this is we put the bounds of the non-sensitive region in the first bounds register, and then every time before we dereference a non-sensitive pointer, we execute the or insert the bounds check instruction. So effectively, it's it's a bounds check implemented in hardware that we can use for the non-sensitive region. Um, the last one, the the yellow one bar, is uh, a feature of the x8664 instruction set called address override prefix. And what it does is it tells the processor to interpret the memory operands of this instruction as 32-bit values. So you put this magic number for the instruction, and then it will assume that all your pointers are 32 bits. So instructions with this prefix can never uh, reference the sensitive region. And that's the third way we can enforce the isolation. So if you compare the heights of the, heights of the bars, maybe for now focus on the last one, which is the mean, uh, because there's a lot of benchmarks. Uh, we can see that masking is uh, the highest overhead because we're loading this value into a register, doing the AND, and then uh, using the mask pointer. Whereas MPX, we, have, we can use the bounds registers for free, essentially. We might actually have lower register pressure because we're not using a register to store the mask itself. And then finally, the yellow bar, which is essentially invisible, 
uh, is the address override prefix, and it's all in hardware, so it's very, very fast, and it has essentially no overhead. Uh, any uh, negative overhead is essentially measure measurement noise. Um, so the question that arises from this observation is why would we use the different options? So one reason would be almost every processor has an AND instruction, uh, but not every processor supports MPX and address override prefix. And the other good thing potentially about MPX is we could have uh, multiple sensitive regions because the, we could change the values in the bounds registers uh, and have, there are four of them, so we could eventually have four different regions as well. Uh, that's not currently implemented, but that's sort of an idea that could be interesting to pursue in the, in the future. Uh, any questions about this? Uh, now the question we want to answer is, uh, how much have we improved security? Have we done something that's actually going to detect uh, vulnerabilities and attacks uh, in the wild? So we uh, found a, a crypto library uh, called Embed TLS, which is now owned by ARM. Um, and it's used in embedded devices to do crypto. Uh, and there is, luckily for us, there's a CVE uh, found in Embed TLS, which is uh, common vulnerabilities and uh, exposures. So the guy that found it wrote a nice blog post showing uh, how the vulnerability worked, and he also had a proof of concept exploit. So we checked out this version of Embed TLS, compiled it with our uh, protection, our compiler, and then s checked if the exploit would still work. But no, we in fact, we found that we detected the uh, out-of-bounds uh, read, and we were able to abort the program rather than leaking uh, the server's contents. So we were able to detect that the attack was taking place uh, in, a, in a software that's actually used by people out in production and in the, in the real world. Uh, any questions about that? So now uh, I'm going to wrap up the talk and, and summarize the points, the key points. Um, we in data, DCI we have stronger protection for sensitive data, and relaxed protection for non-sensitive data. And the reason we have this relaxed protection is it allows us to have lower overhead overall, and that's a key metric for getting people to actually use our our uh, mechanism. Is that people want really low performance or really high performance in in practice, and we have lower overhead than uh, complete memory safety and we suggest that one of the reasons that memory safety, complete memory safety is not being adopted is that is the prohibitive overhead. <clears throat> and our security evaluation with Embed TLS shows that if our technique is used and we compile Embed TLS with our compiler, uh, we're able to detect a real vulnerability that was found in the software. And lastly, uh, the compiler is now uh, open source. You can go to this URL and uh, check out the software uh, use it yourself, compile your own programs, um, and I would be glad to answer any questions about it or uh, questions about the, the talk, too. Uh, so my question is that, did you already talking with some people about, uh, uh, or some companies who are interested in using this? Or uh, what kind of, what kind of, uh, or if not, then what kind of industry can you focus on for this kind of thing? Yeah, so the interesting thing about my research area is that there is a little bit of a lag between what is the cutting edge research and what is being uh, done in industry. So I mentioned in the beginning uh, CFI, that CFI doesn't protect heart bleed, but it can protect against different attacks, attacks that target uh, control flow. And it is actually being adapted in industry. Um, the the, Microsoft, the new Microsoft, uh, latest Microsoft compiler has a form of control flow integrity. Um, GCC has a form of control flow integrity, and so does uh, LLVM Clang. Um, so the interesting approach for me that I think would be more adaptable to industry is trying to uh, potentially not rely on annotations uh, is one, I think, important direction for future work because it we assume that the programmer knows what's important, but in practice, in industry, you would like to have a tool that works automatically and doesn't require you to go back and say, what are the really important things here? You would just like to have it all work out of the box. Interesting, so. Any other question? Okay, so then maybe just one final thing. Uh, you immediately jump on both confidentiality and integrity, but let's see if I want integrity only. 
Yes. Is there already something easily solvable? Uh, yes. So the okay. interesting thing about confidentiality and integrity is that uh, writes are more rare in programs than reads. So usually you read a bunch of things, you compute some result, and then you write it back to memory. So uh, there's actually a mode in the compiler that only protects uh, writes, that's confidentiality <laughs> or integrity only. Um, and it has much lower overhead because the writes are rare. We have, few, we have to check fewer things than we only check writes. Um, if you want uh, integrity of data, then no, pretty much my approach is the, is the only way if you want partial uh, protection. Uh, Softbound does have a mode that's writes only that they call out in their paper too. Um, but I think that integrity is actually a more maybe uh, widely applicable approach to industry and, and, and end users because it will be low overhead, as I mentioned. It, the, a lot of mechanisms focus on stopping the attacker from corrupting the data rather than stopping the attacker from reading the data, um, be, partly because it's, um, it's uh, lower overhead to protect integrity, but confidentiality on its own obviously doesn't make sense because he can just overwrite, uh, the attacker can just overwrite your protection mechanism to like turn it off. Uh, so you need integrity. So mechanisms do focus on integrity. Any other? Okay. Well, let's then talk. Thanks, Tim, again. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>